Today we're going to talk about uh, uh, something uh, I think that's important to us. We never sent out an email or made any announcement about it, but maybe if you, uh, on social media, or if you just know things that are going on in Israel in general, you know that this past week I uh, was uh, Yom Hazikaron and Yom Ha'atzma'ut. Uh, Yom Hazikaron means Day of Remembrance. It's Israel's Memorial Day. Uh, and it's always the day before uh, Israel's celebration of independent, Independence Day. Yom Ha'atzma'ut is Israel's Independence Day. And uh, since 1953, I believe, uh, you, uh, Israel has uh, observed Memorial Day followed by uh, Independence Day. And the reason for that probably is obvious uh, uh, to us, uh, that we might always remember the cost of independence, the cost of independence and maintaining uh, the independence, you know, of, uh, of Eretz Yisrael. Uh, in Israel, uh, Yom Hazikaron, uh, Memorial Day, uh, the day of, of uh, remembrance, is really a, a very solemn day. Uh, unlike here, Memorial Day is when you paint your picnic table or something, you know. But uh, in Israel, it is uh, a very solemn day. No work is done and so on and so forth. Because uh, almost everyone, just about everyone in Israel knows somebody or knows somebody who is related to somebody who has died in uh, a war uh, in Israel or in some kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Conflict, yeah, some, some type of a conflict uh, in, in, all of these, uh, in all of these years. So it's important, I think, for us to remember that, you know, and uh, important for us to, even though we're not in Israel and not, not really observing it, but uh, to be aware of it and to remember it and to appreciate it and to be reminded once again. I mean, in a way, we're preaching to the choir here, of course. But we always need reminders, uh, you know, of the importance of Eretz Yisrael, of, of Israel, of Jerusalem, and, and to be aware of it. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean, certainly, that um, uh, Israel ca uh, can ever be criticized. We do plenty of that. <laughs> But uh, very important uh, that uh, we, as um, people living in the diaspora, uh, uh, are aware uh, of, uh, of uh, the things happening in Israel and in the world we live in today uh, are supportive of uh, the state of Israel you know, and its um, maintenance, right? Very, very important because we're certainly living in a day when that's certainly uh, nothing to take for granted uh, in, any, uh, in any way, shape, uh, or form, you know. And I, I think it's also poignant to think about the issue of how uh, you have the uh, remembering those who have uh, perished, remembering the cost right before the celebra great celebration uh, on Yom Ha'atzmah, great celebration of, uh, you know, of independence. In the Jewish world, interestingly enough, you know, pain and joy are, uh, are related uh, to each other, right? Think about like at the Seder, right? We eat uh, bitter herbs, and then we eat charoset. We eat maror, and we eat charoset. The bitterness of slavery, that's what we say, and the sweetness of redemption, right? Uh, both are indeed important to us, right? I think of a Jewish wedding. Last Sunday, we watched Ken and Debbie Cornwell uh, renew their marriage vows, and that was a real blessing. Uh, and uh, Ken stepped on a glass, right? We usually, you know, in our world today, stepping on the glass is kind of like saying it's, it's done, you know, it's finished, and so on, and we give it all kinds of meanings. But, you know, the original meaning of stepping on the glass was really remembering uh, on this day of great joy, uh, the pain and suffering uh, that has come before us uh, to get to this day of, of joy. Uh, and, um, and so we remember that. Uh, and then, of course, aren't there many Bible verses 
that talk about uh, out of tribulation comes hope, and hope does not disappoint, you know, things, things of that nature. Think about the death and resurrection of the Messiah, right? Uh, uh, Yeshua's death led to his resurrection. Uh, pain, suffering, uh, and uh, victory, uh, uh, victory. Even the agricultural seasons, the way the uh, agricultural seasons uh, work, right? You have a, a birth, new growth, harvesting, and then in a way, death, and laying fallow, and then starting, um, starting again. So, uh, you know, when we look at the, uh, the history uh, of, uh, of Israel, and we, we think about the history of Jerusalem, certainly we know, we don't have to rehash it, lots of pain and suffering. In fact, uh, in our, uh, uh, the lessons uh, that, uh, that I've had the privilege of uh, in, in uh, uh, being, uh, meeting online with uh, uh, Ellie and Claire, we've talked about Jewish history uh, and uh, talked about the, the, uh, the adapting of the Jewish community to the current uh, situation and whatever it has been over thousands of years. Certainly a lot of uh, pain and suffering and survival, but what, what drove uh, our ancestors and continues to drive, really, the Jewish community uh, is, uh, is hope, a hope indeed for the, uh, for the future. And we certainly see, uh, see that in the, in the scriptures, um, in many, uh, many different places, we read about, uh, you know, the future glories of, uh, of uh, Israel, the future glories uh, of, uh, of Jerusalem. And I thought today I would talk about a little psalm, just one little psalm, and then uh, a couple of words, well, you know me, we'll kind of be all over the place, I guess. <laughs> if, you know, there are uh, some psalms, uh, they're actually uh, referred to uh, as uh, Zion psalms. Zion songs. Uh, Psalm uh, 46, 47, Psalm 48, Psalm 84, Psalm 87, eh, Psalm 132, and a few others. Uh, and the reason they're called Zion psalms is because uh, they, uh, they speak of the glories of Zion. And Zion refers to uh, the, the Temple Mount, the mountain of God, it can refer to the city of Jerusalem as it does in many, many, many passages. Sometimes it's referring to the Jewish people, uh, like daughters of Zion, you know. It's personified often as a, as a, as a mother and a, often synonymous uh, with Jerusalem. And it speaks of glorious uh, times and, and uh, the greatness of God. For example, uh, since I mentioned some of these Psalms, I'll read uh, a few verses from a few of them. In uh, uh, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Uh, we read, uh, uh, just to uh, save some time, if you run down to verse 4 of Psalm 46, there's a rivers whose streams may glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place uh, of the Most High. The, the phrase, the city of God. I uh, is a uh, is uh, a reminder. That's why it's called a Zion Psalm, because it mentions the city of God, the holy dwelling place of um, of the uh, of the Most High. In Psalm forty eight, uh, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, the city of our God, His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, in the far north, the city of the great King. Uh, and so it, it speaks of the greatness and the glory of God and the uh, uh, and the kingdom of God and uh, and uh, and it brings a great uh, great encouragement. Psalm eighty seven though is uh, kind of unique and interesting. It's a small psalm. We don't read it very often. It's only seven verses long, but it really is uh, uh, quite uh, fascinating and uh, perhaps was in the mind of uh, Yeshua, Paul, and Peter in particular in some of the passages that we read in the Brit Chadashah. So Psalm 87, all seven verses, 
uh, uh, is about uh, Zion. Zion. We read uh, in verse 1, His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the other dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. I shall mention Rahab and Babylon among those who know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia, this one was born there. But of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. And the Most High himself will establish her. The Lord shall count when he registers the peoples. This one was born there. Then those who sing as well as those who play the flutes shall say, All my springs of joy are in you. So these, uh, these little seven verses really uh, say a lot, I think, to us uh, about, uh, about Zion, about uh, uh, Jerusalem. When it says his foundation is in the holy mountain, uh, it means, in a sense, that uh, he, ha- he, he has built, you know, he has built the holy mountain. His foundation is in the mountain. His, uh, 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 he, he'll never be removed from the mountain. And you know, in ancient times, mountains were places, uh, uh, especially, you know, among, just among the nations of the world, high mountains or mountains were the places where the gods dwelt, you know? Uh, And so it is uh, rather interesting that uh, we have Mount Zion. We have uh, uh, this mountain uh, is understood to be the, the, the dwelling place of God, as we'll see. God loves the gates of Zion. The Lord loves the gates of Zion. And then more than any other place in Israel, there's nothing like Zion, right? Uh, and then, of course, there are many places in the Scriptures that speak of glorious things about Zion. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. Uh, Jerusalem of gold. Jerusalem shel Zahav. Jerusalem, uh, uh, you know, not only the dwelling place of God, but don't we read a lot of things, uh, indeed, about Zion. Uh, we read uh, here, uh, for example... Uh, the Lord, uh, uh, the Lord roars from Zion. From Jerusalem, He utters His voice. Right? We read that. Uh, we read in Psalm two a great vision of uh, the Messianic King. But as for me, I have installed my King upon Zion, uh, my holy, uh, my holy mountain. Right? Uh, we read in Psalm seventy six, His tabernacle is in Salem, his dwelling place is in Zion. In Isaiah 52, Awake, awake, clothe yourself in strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean will no longer come into you. Uh, And just on and on, there are many verses that speak of uh, Zion as uh, the dwelling place of, uh, of God. Uh, and so, uh, even in the Siddur, it's very interesting, in the Siddur, just a couple of places, uh, there is a, uh, when, we, when we say the Amidah on weekdays, uh, it's much longer than what we say on Shabbat. And there is a particular, I'll just read it in English to save some time, uh, it says, May our eyes behold your return to Zion in compassion. Blessed are you, O Lord, who restores his presence to Zion. Uh, and so Zion is a word that represents uh, uh, the presence of God and all that that means uh, uh, permanently in Jerusalem. It's the place where the king dwells. It's the place where God dwells. It's the place where nations come. It's the place uh, that dispenses the, uh, the, 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 the Torah. Uh, it, is, it is the place where people return to. It is the place where the temple is, where uh, worship ultimately uh, 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 takes place. It is, uh, uh, you know, that, that's what Zion indeed 
refers to. Then there's another place, and, and we sang this this morning already, right? When we take out uh, the, the Torah, you're familiar with it. Vayehi ben Soah Aaron, vayomer Moshe, kuma Adonai, vayafutsu oivecha, vayanusu, misanecha, mifanecha. Ki mitzion teitze Torah, right? Uh, and what that means, for from Zion, the Torah will come forth. And then it goes on to say, you know, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, from Zion. And so this is what Zion uh, represents. You know, in, uh, in another place, in Psalm 50, we read uh, this. The mighty one, God, the Lord has spoken and summon the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown forth. You know, what's very interesting about that, that in uh, the Talmud and other places in rabbinic literature, Psalm 50, this description of Zion in Psalm 50 has led to many stories, Midrash, Midrashim and other, other writings and narratives uh, that talk about God created the world out of Zion, that uh, the beauty of God has shone forth out of Zion. But what it all really points to is the centrality of Zion, the centrality of Jerusalem, right? You know, in, um, in uh, Ezekiel uh, chapter 5, it's a great little, great little statement here, uh, in Ezekiel 5, 5, Thus says the Lord, this is Jerusalem. I have set her as the center of the nations, uh, or as the navel. And some of your translations might say as the navel uh, of, the, uh, of the nations, with lands around her. See, but then it says, but she has rebelled against my ordinances more wickedly than the nations and against my statutes more than the lands which surround her and against my statutes more than the lands which surround her. For they have rejected my ordinances and had not walked in my statutes. And then he's going to talk about how he's going to have to judge her. That Zion will indeed be judged, be cleansed. But that ultimately Zion is the place, ultimate place of messianic centrality uh, and worship. And, you know, this comes out in, in a passage... It's interesting if you read, um, if you read it, not just a few verses, but in big pieces. And I hope, by the way, that you're reading the prophets uh, in uh, big uh, in big pieces, because during the days of counting the Omer, our our reading challenge is to read all the prophets, read all the prophets, and engage in two acts of Chesed, right? And uh, uh, and then on Shavuot. We'll celebrate its completion, and, uh, and I'll be giving uh, uh, a book to anyone who completes it called The Prophets by Abraham Joshua Heschel. Anyway, uh, you know, in, uh, in Isaiah, uh, in the beginning, uh, we read about how uh, God is uh, very unhappy with Zion, uh, very unhappy with uh, you know, with uh, uh, Jerusalem. But then when you come to uh, uh, chapter 2 uh, of, uh, of Isaiah, uh, well, actually, even at the end of chapter 1, after he talks about the, the judgment that's going to come, it says in verse 27, for example, in, in Isaiah chapter 1, Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentance ones with righteousness. Uh, and so there's always a hope. Even when, you know, terrible things happen, uh, there's always uh, hope. And then in chapter 2, uh, you may be uh, familiar uh, with it, right? Uh, in verse 2, uh, it says, And many will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, he may, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth from Zion, right? And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
And so we see that uh, uh, Zion, uh, Jerusalem, uh, is not only, we might say, uh, has a history, uh, and if you ever visit it, it's full of ruins, full of things that are thousands of years old, uh, but uh, it stands for our, our hope uh, of the future, about what will be uh, in Jerusalem. You know, uh, we're familiar with a passage in Zechariah, uh, in chapter 12, uh, where we read, um, in beginning in verse 8, it says, In that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like God and the, and the angel of the Lord uh, before them. And it will come about in that day that I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look upon me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping of the firstborn. And of course, it's talking about the return of Yeshua. It's talking about the return of the Messiah to Zion, to Jerusalem. And then a couple of chapters later, we read in verse uh, 16 of chapter uh, 14, then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate Sukkot. The point is, they're coming to Zion. uh, the, The word of the Lord goes forth from Zion. Zion Uh, is the dwelling place uh, of God. It is the focal point uh, uh, in our worship in the uh, uh, Siddur, uh, and it plays this dramatic uh, role. And it's interesting uh, because, you know, in Isaiah uh, chapter 65, in Isaiah chapter 65, we read about a new heaven and a new earth. But it also, uh, well here, in verse 17 of Isaiah 65, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered nor come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing, and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And it will no longer... Be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. We could keep reading. But the point is, is that just as there's a new heaven and new earth, there's going to be a new uh, Jerusalem. Now, that doesn't mean that the world is going to, the world is gone and it's, you know, in, in some other place and we're not real people. No, we know that there's going to be a resurrection. Yeshua is the prototype of the resurrection. Right? Uh, and, uh, and Jerusalem will be restored, renewed. Uh, the, the, there will be a, a world in which we live where Jerusalem will indeed uh, be uh, the center because it will be the eternal dwelling place uh, of Yeshua, the, the eternal dwelling place of God. Uh, Israel uh, will be restored uh, and fulfill her calling. Uh, is as a nation of uh, priests, a holy, a holy nation, right? Uh, and uh, uh, the, and the, there'll be a restoration of, of nations. And that's what it means when the nations are going to come to Jerusalem, you know, and, uh, and worship. And it's interesting that we read at the end of the book of Revelation about a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem descending, and uh, what, that, what that is referring to, you know, usually conventional wisdom is uh, everything here disappears and we go to heaven. We go to this other place. But actually, it's the other way around. What actually is, is that heaven comes here. And this world becomes, is amalgamated. Now there's this gap, right? We live in the domain of darkness. The world is in rebellion. But when the world is in, no longer in rebellion, there will be this amalgamation once again, as we might say it was in the Garden of Eden, you know? Uh, and so that's important. 
uh, that's important because uh, there's a couple of places in the Brit Chadasha that refer to Jerusalem being a heavenly place, heavenly Jerusalem. For example, uh, in the book of Hebrews, uh, we read here in the 12th chapter, it's kind of interesting. Of course, you know, the book of Hebrews is, was a sermon delivered. It was orally delivered uh, and encouraging people to stick with, stick with the program no matter what. You know, don't abandon Yeshua. Don't abandon the cause of, of Messiah. And that's what he's saying to these Messianic Jews. That's why it's called the book of Hebrews, right? But he says something very interesting uh, here, beginning in verse 18 of chapter 12. It says, For you have not come to a mountain that may be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word should be spoken to them. He's talking about Sinai, right? Okay. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast uh, touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you shall come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and kihilah, congregation of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous men made perfect. I would suggest, and I, I would suggest I, that even though it's not in your cross references, believe it or not, that uh, the writer of Hebrews, I think that he may have been thinking about Psalm 87, Psalm, that little psalm. Because isn't it interesting, in Psalm 87, it talks about God registering people, registering people. In other words, writing, it, writing their names in, no matter where they come from, it's as if they're from Zion, Right? And how wonderful it is to be a citizen of Zion, even if you're from Babylon, even if you're from Rahab, even if you are from Ethiopia, no matter where you're from. And now here in Hebrews chapter 12, he says, who are enrolled, <laughs> enrolled in heaven. I think that's kind of interesting, that relationship of Psalm 87 to this. But what does this mean? Uh, he says, you didn't come to... Can you imagine? It sounds, all, it sounds rough here. He says, you know, you didn't come to Sinai. You came to Zion. What does he mean by that? Well, I can tell you what he doesn't mean. He doesn't mean, he's not comparing them. He's not saying uh, Sinai is bad and Zion is good. He's not uh, referring to uh, old covenant, new covenant. Uh, he's not comparing them. What he is saying is, is that you, you have been to Sinai, right? You have the Torah, but you can't, you know, it, it leads to judgment. As we see in the, in the text, it leads ultimately to, to judgment without the Ruach, without the ability to, uh, to uh, uh, live it out. Uh, he says, but you have come to the dwelling place of God. Zion, heavenly Jerusalem. I remember that Zion represents the dwelling place of God, the place of the king, right? And we know that uh, indeed uh, uh, today Yeshua ascended uh, to the right hand of the Father. And we know from lots of passages uh, that we are in him and we are dwelling in heavenly places and, and so on, right? Is referred to here as a heavenly Yerushalayim. I think that it reminds us at least that the, um, that the focal point is Yerushalayim, is Jerusalem. But the day is going to come, remember, like I said, that it, there's, the new, there's going to be this amalgamation, that Jerusalem in this world will be restored, and Jerusalem in this world will again, will function as Zion, we might say, in a cosmic kind of, a cosmic kind of way. And, uh, and it is very, very important to understand that even in, you know, uh, in Jewish writing, in rabbinic writing, it's very interesting that the focal point of the future is Zion and not Sinai. Sinai is in the wilderness somewhere, 
Zion is the promised land. Israel at Sinai, yes, entered into a covenant relationship, but not, uh, but not the promise uh, of, uh, you know, of, of the forgiveness of sins and the eternality of being in relationship with God. No, that is at Zion. And what happens ultimately, it's not that Sinai disappears, but we know that the, uh, you know, the giving of the Torah and the living out of the Torah takes place in Zion. The, the word of the Lord is dispensed from Jerusalem. The Torah goes forth from Jerusalem. So it's not saying anything here negative about the, the Torah. In fact, you know uh, how uh, we talk uh, about um, last week when I was talking about Ken and Debbie. I was quoting from a, a book about um, a, a man and woman coming together as a perfect asymmetry, right? Two different things fitting together just right. Well, we could say that Sinai and Zion are like that. Sinai by itself uh, ultimately is failure. Zion by itself uh, has no, uh, no boundaries, no limits, no morality, no ethics, no, uh, no teaching, right? Uh, and so uh, we, Zion, Sinai cannot exist without Zion, and Zion can't exist without Sinai. And so the two mountains are like two very important uh, um, signs, or two very important moments in Jewish history, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. But clearly, Mount Zion is uh, indeed the future. In fact, I mean, John Levinson wrote a book called uh, uh, Sinai, uh, Sinai and Zion, an introduction to the Jewish Bible, where he talks about all these things. He talks about this, and it's, it really is an amazing thing. He's a Jewish scholar. Uh, and he writes uh, about how Sinai was a terrest- is understood to be terrestrial, and uh, and this is kind of a funny word that he uses. That Zion is like extraterrestrial. <laughs> you know, it's not from outer space, but it's cosmic in its scope. Sinai is about Israel. Zion is about the world. See, uh, and uh, very very important. So uh, I just wanted to read something here. Uh, about from uh, a, a little commentary that I have uh, on the Psalms, a Jewish commentary, uh, the Sansino books of the Bible. This is uh, not a Christian commentary. It's not a Messianic commentary. Uh, but I want to make the point that we should never get the idea uh, that, you know, we've created our own whole understanding of the, of the future. Uh, as a messianic community, to make it fit into Yeshua or something, right? So I just want to read uh, here uh, a couple of things about Psalm 67, uh, 87. So the title in the commentary, it says, Zion, the world center. This brief poem is one of the most remarkable in the Psalms. Both in tone and outlook, its character is prophetic in the sense that it proclaims the hope of a universal kingdom of God with Zion as its metropolis. Okay, I, and, uh, and then he goes on a little farther uh, to say, The psalmist who wrote this psalm was an idealist of the highest order. His central and foremost thought is of God who made all men and who will in his own time draw all men unto himself. The all-fatherhood of God is an eternal fact which demands the brotherhood of man. God is true to himself, but men are not true to themselves. How's that? Nevertheless, the psalmist with his sublime outlook envisages a time in world history when irrespective of nationality, people will come uh, to themselves and therefore to God. That is what Zion represents. That is the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel is not just about Israel and the Jewish people. It's about the hope of the world with Jerusalem as its center. But in order for it to take place, Jerusalem needs to be a Israel. It needs to be the, the homeland of the Jewish people, the, the Messianic people. 
Uh, and, uh, and, and so, therefore, we're, when we say that, well, today there's a heavenly Jerusalem, the earthly one doesn't matter, it absolutely matters. It matters very much in the same way that we would say that when we come to know the Lord, we have a role to play in the redemption of this world. We don't just go to sleep and wait to die and go to heaven, right? We don't believe th- uh, that, but that we have a role to play in the redemption of, of this world. So therefore, Israel and Jerusalem as a physical location in this world is indeed very important to us. Now, I'll just say this. This, this uh, commentary also goes on to say, uh, when it says, I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon as among them that know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. This one was born there. But of Zion it shall say... This man and that one was born here, and the Most High uh, does establish her. The Lord shall count in the register of the peoples. This one was born there. So he says this, The speaker is God, announcing that the powerful nations which had warred against Israel will become enrolled as citizens of Zion. Rahab, the poetical name of Egypt. It means the haughty, arrogant or was the name of a sea monster in an ancient myth to which the country was likened. Babylon, even the nation which had destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, will be included. And he goes on. So it is, uh, it is an amazing thing. He says, uh, In Zion, to those citizenship, they will be admitted as fully as if they had been part of the native population. So that's not just some kind of, uh, you know, uh, new covenant, uh, manufactured uh, a kind of thing. Uh, Psalm 87 is a vision, indeed, of the future. And doesn't it remind us of a passage in Philippians where we read our citizenship is uh, in heaven. Uh, and of course, Paul was saying our citizen is not, it's not a Roman citizenship that is our primary identity. Uh, it is our citizenship in heaven. But perhaps he also had in his mind this psalm because all, and, and, what, and of course what we read in the book of Hebrews, that, that we are part of this heavenly Yerushalayim. And so just as we say we, we dwell uh, with Yeshua in the heavenly, so we know that there will be a day, though, of dwelling indeed uh, in this world. And by the way, this is just a little aside, and then we'll finish up here. Uh, and that is that there is a, 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 a passage in Galatians. And the book of Galatians speaks of the two mountains also. It's kind of interesting that in Hebrews, we read about Sinai uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, Zion, one being uh, re- referencing judgment, and one referencing joy and the presence of God and and so on. Uh, In uh, uh, Galatians, uh, we read uh, here, actually it's in chapter 4, right? Uh, He talks about here uh, in verse uh, 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman and one by a free woman. But the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son of the free by the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking. For these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Zion, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem from above is free. She is our Mother, for it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for more are the children of the desolate than the one who has uh, a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. And so what he's saying, he's not, obviously, he's not saying anything bad about the Torah or the experience at Sinai, but he's saying that Sinai by itself does not lead to life. Uh, but Zion is where the hope is. Zion has always been the hope of Israel. The Torah was not given as an end unto itself, but to be lived out in the presence of God in Zion. See? And, uh, and so that's what he, is, what he is saying. Even uh, John Levinson, a Jewish 
theologian, a Jewish scholar, not messianic, says that the covenant, covenants play different roles. There's different kinds of covenants. He says the covenant at Sinai was a treaty that, that was conditional upon obedience. But he says the covenant at Zion is the covenant with David, and that is unconditional, that there will always be a king, that the promise of a king will always be. Uh, and, of course, with the revelation that we have in the Brit Harashah, uh, and what we read in the book of Jeremiah, we know that it is the new, the new covenant. The new covenant is not just about the forgiveness of sins, but the new covenant, uh, you know, is that uh, a God will dwell in uh, Yerushalayim on Zion. Uh, we will live with him. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Sins will be forgiven. The Torah will go forth to all the nations. That's all part of uh, what we call uh, the, uh, the new uh, covenant. Um, but it begins with the restoration of Jerusalem uh, you know, and Israel, as we see when the Messiah returns. Just as he came the first time to Israel and to Jerusalem, when he returns, it's to the same place. Uh, and uh, you know, in, um, in uh, Ezekiel, uh, you, you know, we're familiar with uh, chapter 36 and 37. Uh, in chapter 36, Ezekiel says that he's going to vindicate the holiness of his name, that Israel has profaned his name, but you see, this return to Zion, this return to the land, is, um, uh, uh, is unconditional. And this is, this is indeed the, the promise that does not depend ultimately on o- obedience, but God will bring it to pass. He says um, in verse 24, I will take you from the nations and gather you from the lands and bring you into your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my ordinances. So there is a return to the land and a return to the Lord. Can't have one without the other. A return to the land and a return to the Lord. That's what he promises. In chapter 37, this is where Isaiah, where Ezekiel sees this big valley of bones, right? Big valley of bones. And he says, what are these? I don't understand it, right? And, and God gives him this vision, and he sees the bones begin to shake, right? They begin to shake. And slowly, they begin to come together. And slowly, you have like a skeleton. And slowly, you have organs and muscles and everything else. And then you have a dead body. And then God breathes life into the dead body. And what does he say? He says, this is the house of Israel. This is the house of Israel. I think that what is very important for us in this is that when we look at Israel today, uh, we might not think of Zion. Of, uh, we might not think of uh, God dwelling in the midst of, uh, of the land. But I believe very much that the purpose of chapter 37 is to tell us how this passage in chapter 36 is going to take place. And the way it's going to take place is slowly. And, and that there's a process. And that's why in chapter 37, he talks about the bones shaking, and the bones rattling, and that Israel will say, we have no hope, but the bones will indeed come together. And, uh, you know, the fact that there is a, a, um, a land of Israel today called Israel uh, with uh, uh, the centrality of Jerusalem. And even though when you go there, you see ruins that are very old, the best part has yet to come. And, uh, and so that's why it's so important for us uh, to be concerned for Israel and to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem, as we read in Psalm 122, right? Uh, and, uh, and to be aware of it and to never take it for granted. And when we come to this time of year, Yom Hazikaron and Yom Ha'atzma'ut, uh, you know, by, uh, by remembering it, by remembering what uh, took place there and, and the price that was paid, you never take 
uh, that land for, uh, for, for granted and the, the, state of, the statehood of Israel uh, for, uh, for granted. Uh, and uh, the reason uh, that uh, we still we have hope is not just because of what, what goes on there now, but because of the return to Zion of all that God speaks about. Uh, and isn't it a great thing that we here in our congregation uh, at Beth Messiah, we like to say that we demonstrate Israel's future today. We experience Israel's future today. And that you have in Psalm 87, people from the nations coming to Zion, you know, under the kingship of uh, the, the, the king of Israel, right? And we know him to be Yeshua, uh, that we are a community of Jewish believers in Messiah and people from the nations. Uh, and the goal is not that everybody should become Jewish. The goal is, is that it's as we're coming to Zion, uh, you know, under the kingship of Messiah, which is uh, a taste of, uh, of what the future will be indeed of this world. And so may we be able to, to demonstrate a passage like Psalm 87. Uh, and may it make a difference to, uh, in our testimony in the world around us. And uh, when we uh, say the prayers uh, in the, in the Siddur, uh, may we be thankful that we're experiencing in Messiah Yeshua, in a sense, like dwelling in a new Jerusalem now. Yet we know we live here, right? But dwelling in a new Jerusalem now, in Messiah. But looking forward to that day when uh, the King, when Messiah himself, will dwell in Yerushalayim. Let's pray. Lord, uh, God, I pray, Lord, that we might understand that this is not only the hope, the hope of Israel or the hope of the Jewish people or the hope of the land of Israel, but it's the hope of this world and that uh, Jerusalem is indeed the center of it. Uh, and uh, uh, God, in Messiah Yeshua. Uh, and uh, Lord, we look forward to that day. Even though uh, we glory in the fact that we dwell in Messiah, in, as it were, a new Jerusalem. We look forward to that day when uh, the new Jerusalem will be that city, uh, Lord, renewed, restored, uh, God, uh, with Messiah Yeshua sitting on his throne as priest and king, and that the world will be filled with light and morality, you know, and godliness, oh, Lord. May we testify that there is light even in the midst of this darkness. And that, yes, we dwell in the kingdom of the beloved Son. Lord, we pray that in this darkened world, people might see it and see that there is a real alternative to the world in which we live. And we pray in Messiah's name.